So um, the first thing I would like to mention, I would say um, welcome, uh, Galazwi Gopan, welcome. Um, I would like to remind everybody that this session is being recorded. And uh, that means that if you stay, that you are consenting to be recorded and to be mindful that just as you see and hear others on screen, you yourself are being seen and heard. And we do have, uh, I would like to um, say a special welcome to Mary Stewart, who's joining us for anybody who doesn't know today from Florida. And also, um, to have patience with us and some understanding as we navigate this technology and pass things back and forth. Mm -hmm. And to officially begin, I will go over to uh, Jody and ask Jody to um, start with the territorial acknowledgement. On this unceded and unsurrendered territory where we live and work, the Peace and Friendship Treaties were signed between 1725 and 1779 by the LU and the Wallace Dick. I think your, your audio may have gone there, Jody. Oh, that's weird. Um, I'll just start over. Sorry about that. <laughs> Problem. Uh -huh. On this unceded and unsurrendered territory where we live and work, the peace and friendship treaties were signed between 1725 and 1779 by the El Nu and the Wollastiquiwik and the Passamaquoddy nations and the British. These peace and friendship treaties were among the earliest treaties to be made between indigenous nations and Western nations. Despite the efforts of the Canadian government since Confederation to assimilate and erase Indigenous peoples through government policies such as Indian Act and Residential Schools Act, the resilience of Indigenous peoples has meant that Indigenous traditions continue to influence the Canadian political, social, cultural, and environmental landscape today. Thank you so much, Jody. And I guess because uh, people are joining us, they may not know what this series is. I'm going to ask our student, Alison Fitzgerald, to tell us about the guest lecture series. This guest lecture series is organized by the Advanced Studio Practice Program at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design in partnership with the Atlantic Center for Creativity. The purpose of the ASP guest lecture series is to model successful contemporary practice to our students and to inform, inspire, and ignite art and design dialogue and engagement in the greater public community. This, uh, the guest lecture series focuses on New Brunswick and provides a platform for presentation, a time for dialogue, and a celebration of the creative and cultural riches that we hold in Atlantic Canada. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, and I'm going to, at this point, invite uh, Mary Bladerwick to tell us a bit about the ACC because we are partnering with the Atlantic Center for Creativity. So Mary, you might like to say a few words. Sure, thank you. Um, the ACC, the Atlantic Center for Creativity, is an initiative that promotes creativity across disciplines and has three main goals. We've been in existence for about five years now, but, um, and we still have, we basically have the same three that we started with. Um, number one, it's to promote research and programming in the air, in any area of creativity and innovation that's going on, whether that's in the sciences or in business or math or the arts and so on. Um, offer events such as symposia, conferences, and workshops on a yearly basis for sharing our ideas and our information and three, building partnerships in the area of creativity and innovation on a local, regional, and national basis. We are proud to be partnering with the NBCCD uh, on this existing, on this exciting online series, uh, which is advertised in full in the new online journal of the ACC, which is called Creativity Matters. Um, this, and it has just been launched this month, and a lot of you probably have already had a chance to see this. The journal was a collaboration project uh, involving the ACC, Mary Stewart from Florida State University and a Fulbright recipient, and the NBCCD. It contains articles and presentations from the 2019 um, Creative Connections Conference that took place in Fredericton last October. 
Um, it also includes interviews of local creatives and um, links to videos and a full, um, a, a full description of this um, lecture series. So I hope you have a chance to take a look at it. And it was beautifully designed by uh, Carrie Lawler, who is a, the graphic designer at NBCCD. So just a little bit about our background and also our website, if you'd like any further information on the ACC or to become involved with us on any level, um, it's theatlanticcenterforcreativity.com. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, and I'm going to now go over um, to Lee McLean and Lee is going to uh, introduce our guest speaker. And can I ask just before she does that anybody who does not have their microphone on mute that maybe you will do that now just to make sure we can hear clearly. Okay, Lee. Happy to. Professor Emeritus Mary Stewart taught in the Department of Art at Florida State University from 2006 to 2017. Stewart is an artist, author, editor, and educator. Her artwork has been included in over 90 exhibitions, and she is the author of Launching the Imagination, a comp comprehensive guide to basic design, which has long been used as a textbook at NBCCD. In connection with the Fulbright Fellowship she received in 2019, she helped to expand the Atlantic Center for Creativity website and served as the guest editor for the first edition of its journal, Creativity Matters. We are excited to have Mary Stewart join us today. Mary, please. Thank you. Okay. Now, Mary, I'm going to help you out here and hand over hosting to yourself. Yes. There we go. Okay, uh, now do I do share screen here? Yeah, you can, yep. Share screen, share. Uh, now, how do I do the... And now you may want to minimize those or just pull up your PowerPoint from behind, maybe click on this. Okay, together. we will get rid of you. We will put this There up we go. Here. Okay, and does that look good? Yes, I can see that. Yep. Okay, is there any way that these can be maybe a little smaller? On my screen, they look a bit large. Uh, do you mean the center slide looks a bit large? No, the, the uh, images of, of the people over here. On my screen, I have a okay. bunch of us so lined up and that's nice, but it's going to overlap the images a fair amount. So there should be uh, view options on uh, the top panel. Okay, let's see what that does. Oh, dang. Yeah. And then there's a little view panel to uh, the top right hand corner too that says side by side speaker or side by side gallery, or you can go uh, exit full screen. So I don't I don't see, there's nothing on the right hand side for me. Okay. Let's see what this does. So if I'm the active speaker, huh, yeah, I don't see. Um, hmm. Did you try, and um, does the view options have a standard view, Mary, on top? Um, damn. Um, let's try again here. Yeah, it can be tricky as people log in, then more and more squares appear. Well, you can just be there. That's fine. Um, okay, well, whatever. I'll, I, I'll just go ahead. Um, so there's, you know, kind of the basic information on my um, academic background. So can you see this, the images reasonably well? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's my um, uh, academic background, basically. Um, in this uh, presentation, what I really want to talk about are three main questions. Um, where has my studio practice been? which of my current projects have the greatest potential, and how can actions today uh, feed future art practices? 
Um, I really have a fair amount of background. I, as I mentioned before, I'm over the age of 60, so hopefully one has done something. Um, my primary focus in high school was ceramics, um, and uh, I made it through many a boring faculty meeting by designing pots, actually, while, <laughs> while people were haggling over things. Um, my BFA and MFA are in printmaking, and uh, I actually um, worked at the Tamarind Institute of Lithography, which is a major printmaking uh, site in New Mexico as soon as I finished my BFA with the intention of becoming a master printer. Um, uh, after a summer of working in that uh, venue, I realized that I really didn't want to become a master printer. It's a hell of a lot of work and not nearly as gratifying intellectually as one might have hoped. Um, and then I also have done other coursework in fibers, photography, and um, have studied quite a bit of film history. We've already mentioned launching the imagination. Uh, this thing kind of came out of left field. I was not planning to write a 400 page book. Um, but I had been very involved with a national organization uh, related to foundation teaching with a somewhat tongue-in-cheek acronym of FATE, Foundations in Art, Theory, and Education, a very earnest um, grassroots organization that's been around now for about 40 years. And I was quite involved with them. Um, and uh, because of that, the publisher, McGraw-Hill, actually called me up and asked me if I wanted to write a book. This, let me tell you, is unusual. <laughs> that's, that's a nice way to, to be seeking out a, a book project, having them call you. Um, and so this book evolved out of that. And um, I was amazed and pleased, of course, to see that it's in use at the college. It's already been mentioned that um, I uh, helped to bring this uh, into fruition. And um, we've already heard from Mary Blatherwick, who uh, is really my uh, collaborator on the Fulbright Project. Um, and this uh, journal is part of that process. And I too want to really applaud Carrie Lawler who took some very good text we had, but it wasn't real extensive. It was just good solid stuff and turned it into something that's really visually engaging and much more informative. I've also been working on a couple of um, other book projects. Uh, this one was a curious one. It's been self-published on Amazon. And um, it was a matter of pulling together a bunch of essays on, great, on gifts, something you gave or something you received uh, that was transformative in some way. Um, and it's raised over $100 for food banks so far. I also want to talk a little bit about Fulbright. Um, you can see the basic information there, uh, 8,000 grants annually. Um, uh, this is just Fulbright Canada, actually. Um, and so you can see all the information there, lots of different information there. Um, so it's designed to support an international exchange of scholars. I would definitely recommend uh, that students and faculty, professionals, consider applying for a Fulbright Fellowship when the time is right. It's a rather formidable application. Um, when in doubt, expect more paperwork. Um, but if you do get a Fulbright, even though the financial support is quite modest, uh, it opens doors, and the reason for that is because there have been so many Nobel Prize and uh, Pulitzer Prize winners who have been associated with Fulbright. And then there's me. I'm neither a, Ful a, uh, a Pulitzer Prize nor a Nobel Prize winner, and I don't anticipate either. Um, however, um, one thing I enjoyed, especially on my most recent trip in 2019, was learning about kitchen parties. 
<laughs> and um, I might get inspired enough to try to brush up my uh, very rusty guitar playing skills so that next time I'm up there, I can contribute more helpfully to the singing. So uh, in context with the Fulbright, I give presentations, workshops, critiques. Basically, the concept is for me to contribute in any way I can. And this was a uh, workshop um, just using felt markers and um, just white paper, uh, dealing with an idea about developing a labyrinth. Uh, from starting from a line. And you can see that um, Dr. Blatherwick is over there on one side working away along with her students. So um, I would like to talk a little bit about criteria for excellence. Um, there are some artists whose greatest strength is in their uh, tight focus. They basically deal with a narrow band of ideas and they uh, and techniques, and they stay with that thing. They're very, very focused on that thing. My inclination is to be more of a generalist. I'm not a specialist so much. I'll try anything I can think of um, if I can pull it off technically, if I feel like I can actually make something that's decent in craft. Uh, so that it's worth looking at. So what I'm most interested in is a mix of having things that are conceptually inventive, which basically means that the ideas are rich and resonant, and also things that are visually compelling, so that the idea is manifest in a way that a broad uh, audience can uh, appreciate it. Um, by contrast, I would note uh, that a lot of contemporary American art, at least, and I would suspect this is true really globally, a lot of contemporary American art is not conventionally pretty by a long shot or even beautiful by a long shot. Uh, it's often very fierce, it's often quite political, and it may or may not uh, attract a very broad audience. Here's another example. Uh, this is um, using actual objects, you know, shoes and things like that to create an installation. Again, something that can be very rich and interesting, but certainly not something that the general audience is perhaps so accustomed to. Uh, Petit Coin's work is actually very beautiful when you see it in person. Um, when you see it in photographs, it's uh, a lot dead flowers and taxidermied birds and things like that. So once again, it's really very rich. It's conceptually very intriguing uh, and very engaging to look at, but certainly not conventionally pretty. So what I'm looking for in my work is again, to have things that are conceptually rich and also sufficiently visually engaging that it's going to attract a broad audience. So now I'm gonna shift into talking about some of my past work, kind of giving an overview or sort of a survey, including uh, ideas about the figure in motion, the figure as expression, and ideas about body language and collaborative choreography. So here's an example uh, of something dealing with the figure in motion. Uh, this is a fairly large uh, image, uh, 30 by 58 inches in size. And uh, especially two of the figures, the one on the right and on the left, um, I didn't actually have a model who was a, a superhero who could hold poses like that without help. She was actually leaning up against a wall. They were still hard poses to hold, and that's one reason the image is so gestural. But because I did not draw the wall, it makes for a rather curious and highly dynamic image, I think. 
This was from another series, um, a rather fierce series actually, uh, called Losing My Senses. I was in the midst of a um, major uh, transition uh, academically, uh, professionally, um, called tenure. I don't know how common that is in Canada, but in the U.S. it's like the job application to end all job applications. If you get it, you essentially have a job for life, and if you don't get it, you have an extra year of grace, and then basically you're asked to leave. So <clears throat> even if you've been teaching effectively someplace for quite some time, it is a very stressful experience. So I did this series called Losing My Senses in response to this experience and deliberately chose a male model so that I wouldn't psychologically project onto a female figure. If it's a female figure, I, I tend to begin thinking I'm her in a way. But with a male figure, certainly it's a different um, psychological dynamic. And uh, so that resulted in a whole series of images. Uh, another one um, about that same time, uh, this is a uh, lino cut. So it's unmounted uh, battleship linoleum. So I actually print this on an etching press, having um, set the pressure just right. Um, and uh, again, you can see it's, it's rather uh, large. It's almost a meter tall. And I also did a series of um, images uh, related to uh, collaborative choreography. Uh, this was a project I did with a semi-professional dance company, um, and it included these projected photographs of some of the dancers, so that the dancers were uh, dancing with the photographic projections. I I also have dealt a lot with serial imagery, meaning multiple images to express an idea, and that has included book arts, video, stop motion, and animation. Here's an example of one of the visual books. This was done at uh, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts in uh, near Lynchburg, Virginia, um, and also near a smaller town called Sweetbriar. And this was from the first time I went there. I've actually been there about 10 times now, but the very first time it was especially magical because it was so unfamiliar. And so I wound up with this whole series of watercolors and drawings uh, that I bound together to make a book. Another image from that uh, same era, roughly, is this one, Labyrinth, and it deals with um, Greek uh, imagery from the Parthenon, and also we can kind of see over there a uh, rampaging bull, and that's actually based on um, a, uh, a cave painting, uh, I think it's Lascaux, uh, cave painting. Uh, so I'm kind of referencing ways that humans have actually developed knowledge is really what this uh, book is about. And it collapses. It's sort of like a glorified pop-up book so that it collapses completely flat and then it opens up. It's about 17 inches tall and it can be manipulated to create four different sculptures, essentially. Okay, so why don't you want to proceed? That's weird. Okay. <clears throat> Another more extensive series, Apocalypse, was a response to the Gulf War in 1991. Uh, for a U.S. point of view, this is a uh, George Bush the first, um, wherein uh, the Americans uh, came in to uh, drive Saddam Hussein and his folks out of Kuwait, uh, rather a dramatic event. 
and especially so as I was living in London at the time. I uh, was going over there to teach for Syracuse University, uh, with which I was associated at that time. And the day I arrived was the day that Iraq invaded Kuwait. So I had been doing these figurative images and I realized it just didn't seem right. And so I shifted to doing some images to try to respond to the war. And this was ultimately the result. I did over a hundred images on sm small pieces of paper, uh, you know, like notebook size. And then from that, I distilled that down and created a series based on some text from a book called Killing Mr. Watson, which deals with a historical event uh, in Florida in the uh, 1920s of a hurricane uh, destroying a, a community, essentially. And the titles are important. The sun roars, the trees groan, the winds writhe, the seas bleed, the stars chant, the sky explodes, worlds end, and the heavens weep. And here's a couple of the drawings. I initially did a bunch of small drawings. I then thought about what I needed to do next. I expanded some of those drawings. Uh, the drawing shown here is uh, pastel and charcoal on toned paper, and then created linoleum prints from that. And again, this one is almost a meter tall. And then um, I went on to the learning series, which is probably the most ambitious series I've done, uh, probably conceptually. They're based on dialogues by Plato, in which he's really puzzling over the nature of knowledge and thinking that knowledge and death are very associated. Uh, it results in an installation of 12 images, each of which is about the size of a standard door. And they're set up in such a way so that there's three on each of four walls facing inward. And the titles repeat, learning to sink, learning to swim, learning to breathe. So that if you stand in the center of the room and just look around what surrounds you, you will go sink, swim, breathe, sink, swim, breathe, sink, swim, breathe. And the notion is, again, based on Plato, or my interpretation of Plato, I should say, that we sink, that is die, we transition, and then we breathe. We come to another uh, case of, of understanding. I was also uh, practicing Buddhism with some conviction at that time. I'm somewhat backslid now, but in any case, um, so it was a way to try to deal with something that was pretty conceptually complicated in a visual way. And I think I'm going to speed things up just a bit so that we stay on target here. So again, sink, swim, breathe. These are examples. Here's a couple more from that series. And again, these are uh, about 84 inches tall. So I guess that's about a meter and a half or more than that, and um, about a meter wide. I also do uh, more playful things sometimes, not very often. I, I, I like to ha have humor and wit, but uh, in my artwork, I tend to be pretty serious. But this was a series I did for a environmental center in Utah. Uh, these are 12 by 12 inches and they are enameled glass. And there we have a lovely salamander. So this is getting more into the present. Um, I'm defining present rather broadly, as you can see. Started in 2006 when I moved back to Florida. I had grown up southwest of Miami in a farming community. 
Uh, I'm sure it's uh, probably condominiums now. But at that time, a uh, rather uh, a rural uh, setting. And then I returned to Florida in 2006, now moving to North Florida. The landscape is very dramatic, very swampy. There's plenty of snakes. And um, so I became very interested in complexity and fragmentation. And I continue to try to develop concepts. So this one, again, is rather large. For those of you who are familiar enough with inches, uh, you can see that, or less so. Uh, again, it's about a meter, a little bit more than a meter um, tall. And this uh, deals with hurricanes. Um, we're, of course, having more and more these days. But uh, I remember them from being a child, uh, always a very dramatic event. Um, this is another series of uh, digital images. And if we can go back to this one, this one is digital and then there's a lot of drawing on the surface. These are entirely digital and they deal with continuity in nature so that you're thinking about almost like a microscopic image, even like looking at a microscopic slide and then thinking about how that relates to the entire forest. Dealing further with the idea about transitions and connections in nature, I became very interested in uh, the way we see different things in the forest, uh, the way we experience the water, the trees, the wind, and so on, the layers of information we may take in. Another one uh, from that same series, this one was done in Wyoming, which has a very distinctive landscape. Uh, I was in northeastern Wyoming, and uh, it's very brown, very stark, and very beautiful. Another one from Florida, um, Blackwater in Florida actually re refers to rivers that have a lot of tannin in them. So the water does in fact appear black. Um, and black water rivers are not only mysterious, um, but they are favored by alligators. Alligators don't much like clear water, uh, really. They, they kind of like it when it's uh, black water sometimes. Um, and so it makes it even more mysterious and somewhat threatening. And again, rather a large image, and this one is entirely digital. It doesn't have additional drawing in. I mentioned before that um, unlike some contemporary artists, I value beauty um, as well as concepts. It doesn't have to be pretty to be good, but now and again, I want to just make something that just looks real great. And this was one of those examples. I'm often inspired by literature. Uh, this one was inspired by a poem by Wallace Stevens, a very interesting American poet, uh, who was primarily a businessman, and then he would go home at night and write these really strange poems. And uh, this one is called The Anecdote of the Jar. And uh, basically it's, uh, saying that as soon as we place any human object in nature, we change nature. He's, of course, much more eloquent on that subject than I am. I recommend the poem. So uh, this is a national, uh, this is a uh, topographic map um, available from the, the um, U.S. Geological Survey. And then I uh, added digital images on top of that. This one is point of departure and another large scale image. And then this is uh, kind of ongoing, the same stream twice. So with this, um, I've returned to Greek philosophy. 
there were a number of Greek philosophers before we got to Socrates and Plato. Uh, and one of those, Heraclitus, um, is a particularly mysterious character. And uh, probably the only thing very many people have ever heard that he is, uh, has been attributed to him is no man ever steps in the same river twice for it is not the same river and he's not the same man. So thinking about how we are changed and how the river of our experience constantly changes led to this series. It started off with some black and white images that were repurposed from existing digital files that I had, and I just started putting them together and recombining them in different ways, essentially doing digital collage. That then led to this kind of stuff, which um, is made up of a bunch of components so that these 12 inch by 12 inch images can be moved around creating new images every day if the gallery wishes to do so. This is another uh, variation on the same stream twice. Uh, in this case, these are printed on aluminum panels, again, that can be moved around. And if you look carefully, it's the same content, but it has been moved around. And the next thing I hope to pursue is more work with murals and installation. I'm interested in reflective surfaces. I'm interested in resonant ideas. And I'm interested in um, images that uh, people experience in a sequential way so that as they walk along, they encounter different imagery. So I have just uh, put in an application for an artist's residency um, in which I propose to work on these mural type images. Uh, and I gave a, a particular corridor size. The residency is only for three weeks. And so um, I felt like I had, I had to limit it in an appropriate way. And so I basically said, I want to deal with the same stream twice, but use a corridor in which at least two facing walls um, kind of uh, talk to each other and to the people walking through the corridor, especially if the imagery is printed on reflective material, and there is a way to do that, then the people as they moved through the site would be reflected on both walls as well. So I think it has quite a bit of possibility. I'm going to end up with talking about a few artists as inspiration. I'm very struck by the amazing things so many artists are doing with installations. Uh, this is another way of thinking about fibers. Uh, making a whole room full of information. I love the work of Ned Kahn. Uh, actually, he studied environmental science, and he has made a lot of artworks that take up the entire side of a building, oftentimes using mirrored panels, thousands of mirrored panels that shift and change position as the wind passes by and they also reflect the changing sky. I also love this guy's work, uh, Leo Villarreal. Um, if you're ever, ever in the National Gallery in Washington, DC, uh, there are two main buildings there, the East and the West Building. And you can walk from one to the other uh, right at the street level, but don't do that. Go into the underground level and there's an underground corridor through which you can walk, which gives you an experience in this artwork called Multiverse. And it has hundreds of thousands of lights that go off in different patterns uh, based on uh, the digital programming. 
another few examples of ideas about corridors. Uh, this one has some remarkable number of uh, silhouettes of butterflies. This one, again, uses mirrored imagery. This one is enormous. Um, it's, uh, there we have a top view there. If you look carefully, you should be able to see how you can kind of um, walk through this entire labyrinth. And then also we have a view of what you might see once you're inside. So a lot of artists are really combining art and architecture. Sometimes they're doing interesting things with materials and creating whole worlds in that way. And this is the place I've applied for the residency. It sounds like it should be just up the street from you, the Atlantic Center for the Arts. But in fact, it's just up the street from me. It's about a two hour drive from where I live uh, in Florida. And I hope to goodness I get approved for the residency. There is my contact information. Um, my website is perpetually not completely up to date, but it's quite robust, gives lots of information. And I've got a number of projects going right now. I just signed a contract for a book on creativity. So if uh, you contact me on email and I don't respond instantly, uh, don't be surprised. Um, but do uh, send me a second uh, try um, if you really want to get in touch. Okay, now let's see if we can exit that. Get rid of you. And I hope I'm still on the stop share. Oh, That's it. dang. I, it's, like, it's like talking to the screen. I hope you heard something there. It was rather weird. <laughs> yes, we did. That's good. And did you, you've passed uh, the hosting back to myself. Did you, Mary? Maybe if you could do that right now oh. so that we don't forget. Okay. So in the little drop down participant window, just to, yeah. Well, um, yeah, there's the little participant thing, and there's you, and here's more. Make host. Change host. Okay. That's it. Good stuff. Okay, now let me see. Can I get rid of that? Well, maybe I don't need to get rid of that. Okay. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I think that's part of the technology thing too. There's this like strange awkwardness or the interruption afterwards. Um, I th I'm really struck actually at listening to that because, you know, w when we came to know you, we came to know you through uh, your textbook, through launching the imagination. And so from a distance for us, your identity was very much about being an author where in actual fact, at heart, you're, you are an artist just as much and you are a practicing artist. And I think that it's uh, for me very encouraging and also uh, very reassuring um, to kind of see all of those bodies of work and uh, and also to um, have an understanding that artists can be many things actually and that the expression of what you want to do can go in directions with words but that you can also uh, hold and have a studio practice too. Well I think actually um, that training as an artist is um, greatly underestimated in many cases. Um, and this doesn't come as any great insight. I'm sure many people have realized that oftentimes artists are underestimated and that talent is overestimated. That the notion that, you know, somehow there's these kind of strange characters running around in a population who are the creatives and the others are the sinners in darkness and never to be redeemed or something like that. And my uh, experience, both as a teacher and as an artist, has been that, yes, there are people who have more of a propensity or more of an aptitude for certain kinds of things. I, you know, probably when Matt 
got his hands on ceramics, he knew right away that that was something that was really right for him. You know, another person, they, they, they realize photography is, is definitely it. They really don't want to paint. They really want to make photographs. That said, I think that the versatility, the self-reliance, um, and the tenacity that characterizes artists is very, very important and often underestimated. Um, I remember reading years ago, um, a bunch of people were being laid off in Detroit at the auto manufacturing plants. And they brought in people from uh, actors, they brought in actors from the world of theater to help them transition and help them deal with the rejection, the feeling of rejection. Because of course, actors probably are so accustomed to rejection that, you know, it's just considered normal. Uh, but of course, for these poor folks who had expected to have pretty much a job for life, they now are scrounging around and trying to figure out what to do. And it was completely new to them. So I would say, uh, you know, it's perfectly fine. If some people, all they want to do is be in their studio and make their work. And my favorite colleague from Florida State is of that kind. He's a wonderful painter. And boy, the last thing on the planet he wants to do is give a lecture or write a book. That's the last thing he wants to do. And that's just fine, you know. But it, it doesn't mean that we should underestimate the range of capabilities we may have. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the chat window here and um, I have, there are two moderators, Ben and Tracy, who are with us, who have been watching that window for questions or comments. Um, how are we doing, Ben and, and uh, Tracy there? Um, so I'm not seeing any, any questions in the chat panel on my end, but um, yeah. If anybody has any questions, I'll just direct them to the chat panel to type them out and Trace and I can kind of go back and forth uh, reading them out just so we're not all talking at once. Sure. Or now if, if, uh, if there's not a lot in the chat window, if people just want, does anybody have any questions or comments for Mary? No? Hello? Yep, we hear you. Hello, hello. I found this very fascinating, Mary. I did get to know you a little bit last year when you came and that was wonderful and I hope you'll be back. We were disappointed the, this spring that you were not able to continue uh, with your wonderful project here. You opened up our minds about a lot of stuff and I think uh, you're, you've got such a direct approach uh, to uh, direct delivery, especially of your thoughts and your insights that uh, I find that very inspiring. What I like to see today in your work was the sense of place uh, that you come from, your landscape, uh, how it influences your art and how you um, <coughs> You delve in that, and it's so foreign to us. When you showed the snakes, I nearly ran away, and then you know, I don't, I don't want to look at them. I'm afraid from, from that. But it really, I, uh, there's some, I don't know. It makes me uh, understand you a little bit more, I guess, with all those images and the, the way you are creating your work. And although it seems so far from us, which it is, I mean, the landscape are so dramatically different. So I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I want to touch on that. And I think I'll be looking a lot more at your work right at, after this. Well, one thing I'll comment on is uh, when I was there in fall of 2019, there was this wonderful show. I think it was, it was at the college actually. And it had, in fact, I'm quite sure it was. It had to do with, uh, you, you the, the, had gone as a group to the Bay of Fundy and, and responded to the rocks and the water. And, the, and um, I thought, what a wonderful premise for a show. And what a wonderful way to spend some class time. And I think, um, you know, oftentimes when we talk about a sense of place, I think uh, we tend to think about, you know, almost a cultural place or a, 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 um, a, a community. And 
honestly, as much as I love dealing with uh, people all over the place, uh, that's not what I tend to focus on, uh, as you can see. I, I'm, I'm dri driven by the landscape overwhelmingly. And every landscape is fabulous. And one of the landscapes, in fact, that I most want to really develop and turn into a robust body of work uh, is from Cape Breton. Uh, I did a hiking trip before I came over and worked on the Fulbright with you folks. And there was one especially magical forest that was extraordinary. And I'm still trying to figure out how to most effectively deal with those images. That show actually, Jen Lee has reminded us, was called Beneath the Surface Residency in Fundy. Yeah. Um, and two kind of related questions have come in. One is, um, Lee wants to know, do you spend a lot of your own, doing uh, your own photography, a lot of time doing your own photography? And, um, and Marilyn asks, like, can you talk a bit more about this interest in reflection and what that means to you? Ha, ah, boy. Um, that's a particularly rich question. Uh, the first one is pretty easy to answer. No, I don't spend a lot of time doing photography. Um, I, um, and <laughs> my photographs I do on my cell phone. Um, I have an iPhone, a rather old one actually. It's, I'm not, you know, some terrific piece of technology. And um, I just whip that thing out and take photos whenever I see something that looks remotely promising. Um, the images are so manipulated in Photoshop that uh, anything that that has uh, any any bones to it at all that I can work with um, is is possible. And so, if I'm on a roll, I may easily take 50 photos and then sort that out and distill it down to maybe 20, and then use. Of those in various ways in one of the images I create digitally using Photoshop. And I'll make a comment also about Photoshop. I've used it um, with some consistency since the 90s, 1990s. I've used it for a long time. I really got so I was using it in uh, 2006 when my imagery became primarily digital. And part of that was a time consideration. I was writing a book. I was doing a pretty demanding administrative job teaching. Uh, I just was overextended. And being able to manipulate things in Photoshop was very helpful. Um, but no, I don't spend a lot of time. I, it's very automatic. I just whip out the phone, take shots, and, um, and then see what I can make of them in the studio. On the other question, uh, reflection, of course, the perhaps obvious thing is just to think of mirrors. Um, and when you start thinking about the implications of mirrors, um, just visually, uh, and how you can create almost something that looks like it's, um, a, you know, you can create a sense of infinity through ways you set mirrors up. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of things there. But we also use the word reflection to think about thinking carefully about something or thinking back on something. And that would be a particularly rich implication to the word reflection in context of my same stream twice, the idea that, that no one can walk into the same stream twice. Everybody changes, the cells in your body change, and your experiences change, and your thoughts change. And also the river, whether it's a literal river of water or a metaphorical river of experience, it changes constantly. I see there's a couple of other chats, but I'll let you guys sort through those because I'm yeah, not. Yeah, sure. I mean, Jen has mentioned how you'd love Marlene Crete's work, and you may know and be familiar with her work. Um, I ha I was struck, and, and we chatted about that, uh, the notion of reflection, too, that immediately I made a connection with Eli um, 
Oliver Eliasson's work mm -hmm. that I saw at the Tate Modern in London in 2003. And I was really struck that when I saw your etching and your, your work came first, his work came afterwards. And these are those beautiful coincidences that sometimes we, we see imagery and icons or combinations of things used. And then we see other iterations um, of them speaking to the same thing. And his work was actually created um, using reflection, using lamps reflected downwards and mirrored ceilings. Um, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. I love his work. Yeah. Anybody got any more questions or comments for Mary? Do you mind if I share my screen and show that work, Mary? Show, oh, you, the funny painting? <laughs> no, 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 no. The the Olafur Elias. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Go right ahead. Go okay. right ahead. We we have a a pause there anyway in questions. So let's see if I can bring this up. Can everybody see this image? You give me a thumbs up. Okay, yeah. And then this is uh I reduced the size of that, Mary's etching. And so mm -hmm. That work, I, I remember, was ingrained because I had traveled from du Dublin and took my students to London to see it. And it was a massive installation called the Weather Project. And so he created this giant half lamp with the mirrored ceiling and people went in and saw themselves in the ceiling and immediately lay on the floor in order to see their own reflection. And so when you walk into the space, it, it, it created this great vault and uh, it looked like a post-apocalyptic scene. But the entire staging of it, I was really struck. It was, uh, it was very similar to the narrative that you had within your work. Yeah. Yes, it's remarkable. And also just on the subject of coincidences, um, uh, that series, the learning series, um, it's not always the easiest thing to display because it, you know, it requ requires a certain kind of space, and and I don't, I've not always had the ideal um, space to create the surrounded effect that I prefer. But um, uh, one of the best uh, opportunities for display was um, at uh, Saint Bonaventure University in Western New York State, fairly near Buffalo, New York. And that was the one occasion where I had artwork. Um, they, there was a request that artwork be removed from a show. And um, we would have to go way back to those images, which would be a little complicated at this point. But um, if you remember, you just showed one, this kind of black and white. Uh, they're actually drawings, and a mix of drawing and Xerox transfers was actually how those things happened. Because again, they're the size of doorways. So they could be made as an etching, but you'd have to have a heck of a press or do them in components. But in any case, on that occasion, um, the gallery was approached and there were several images that uh, people requested be removed. And the reason um, was because that show was occurring in September of 2001. September 2001. Well, that was the September of 9-11, the World Trade Center, um, destruction of the World Trade Center. And the series deals with death. I mean, some of the images look like you're falling through, through building debris from a great height. But of course, the images were made um, a couple of years, in most cases, before that show ever happened. The, the images that were actually being uh, criticized in that case, uh, they weren't obviously made 15 minutes before the World Trade Center came down. They had been made some time before. The gallery, of course, declined to remove the images. But it is interesting how I think artists often are tapping into perhaps um, another 
line of thinking or something without even knowing it, that there's like an undercurrent of the collective unconscious that you're maybe picking up on and you may almost anticipate something that will happen later. Yeah, agreed. Thank you, Mary. Um, there's one maybe a, a quick question that's come from Alison and she says um, she's looking for the name of the poem by Wallace Stevens. I'm pretty sure it's Anecdote of the Char. There we go. Uh, there's also another um, reference, uh, which is Parable of the Jar, and I think that's biblical. Mm -hmm. But the Wallace Stevens poem is very brief. Um, I placed a jar in Tennessee, it starts out. Um, and you should be able to find it online quite easily. Thank you so much. Well. We have uh, 12.59, so I wanted to, on behalf of everybody, thank you for very generously sharing, sharing your work and your ideas. And um, we're so grateful and happy that you've been involved and we have benefited so much already from, we're very fond of you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am too. I so <laughs> miss being in Fredericton. Oh. We miss you. We miss you. Um, and to wrap up, just to kind of another word of celebration um, to say congratulations to our own Kirsten Bishop, who was chosen for the 2020 Nels Oldman Award. Um, congratulations also to Yalda Borzag, who is a graduate from here, our ceramics department in MBCCD. And she has received the Maria Len Allen Fellowship from the Sheila Hugh Mackay Foundation, which is an incredible big award, you know, thousands of dollars and uh, wonderful recognition for her talent and her work. So congratulations. And thank you to all of you for joining us from everywhere. And a reminder that next week, our speaker on the October 1st is Tony Merzetti. And I believe Tony had joined us today. Um, so we're very much looking forward to Tony's talk. That's it, folks. So take care. Have a great week. Thank you, Mary. And um, we will all log out. And I guess my ASP students and Mary, we may um, log out, take a minute or two, and then maybe use this link and log back in to chat. Sounds great. And thanks for all the notes. I'm getting all sorts of notes saying thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I so miss Fredericton and my yeah. Canadian friends. I'm looking yeah. forward to being there, I hope, uh, I, uh, in August of next year. Yeah, soon, Mary, soon. Okay. Yes. Have a great week. Okay. Bye, everyone. Okay.